Adventure Time. Good morning, how are you? Hi, how are you? Excellent. Tell what Stan. Let's pretend that just didn't happen, okay? Mr. Aaron? I say something, you say something, okay? Singing all of your promises won't let go of me. Good morning. Welcome to City Church downtown. My name is Doug. I'm one of the pastors here, and I want to welcome you, especially if you're new to City Church. And uh, I know we always have a lot of people coming for the first time. You know, did everyone wake up okay today? It's time change day, right? Okay, all the good Christians went at 10 o'clock. They remembered, right? And all the rowdies are here at 1130, okay, uh, who slept in in the later in the day. 
at one o'clock, all the really rowdies will be here. I just want to tell you that. So if you ever want to try one o'clock service, we'd love to have you there. But hey, I got to explain one of the things that we do. One of the worship elements that we include in our services from time to time is congregational prayer. And I want to explain what that is and why we do it, for, particularly for those of you who are new. We'll have a song here in a minute, and you'll see people walking to the front, to these red rugs at the front. Some will grab a pillow and put it on their knees, and you'll see people literally kneeling in prayer before the Lord. Now, if you're new here, don't feel like you have to do that. You know, that's kind of voluntary, right? But the reason many of us do it is because we find that the longer we're Christ followers, the easier it is for our hearts to get hard. And when we bow before God in humility, in a physical posture of humility, we find that it does something to our hearts to keep them humble before God. We don't get a lot of traction in our relationship with God when our hearts are hard or prideful towards God. But when we humble ourselves before him and kneel and pray, then he moves. And here's what's at stake. Here's why we're praying. Because we want to see people come to relationship with God. We want to see marriages saved, some of them our own. We want to get out of addictions and into lives of freedom. We want to pray for those who are food insecure and struggling in poverty in our city. And so that's why we pray. We ask God to move in our city. We ask God to heal our city and change our city. And so if you're comfortable to do so and physically able, we want to invite you to join us in a humble posture to pray, not only for our city, but for this particular service. Because for some of you, God arranged the circumstances of your lives to bring you here, to give you a word about something significant in your life. And if you'll open your heart to it and humble yourself before God in prayer, whether it's in your seat or down at the front, God will give you an experience with him. We don't just do a little show here, but we want an experience with where we hear from God who is living among us. So let's pray and ask God to move among us.
world has nothing So many times this song ministered to me while I was in a very dark and distant place. It's one of the first songs that broke down a piece of my wall. We can't see, Lord. We can't see, but we believe. We can't see, but we believe. You are with us. You are with me. Holy Father, you are. Every song, every prayer I lift to you, Lord, it's true. You are here. You 
Jesus, I 
pray. And everyone say, Amen. Hey guys, it's Sandrine and we are back for another week of announcements. So let's jump right in. This coming Saturday, the Strong Foundation Playground build is continuing. Now the Strong Foundation is a shelter for homeless families and we have a team that's been working to put a playground together for the kids there. So if you're interested in helping out, you can go out to the lobby after service and sign up with a volunteer. Next thing, City Youth, we are back this Wednesday, so be sure to join us, 6.30 to 8.30. We're right here next door in the cafe. If you want more information, you can visit our Facebook page, City Youth Downtown Easter. We've talked a lot about Easter. Sunday, March 31st, we'll be over at the Lone Star Pavilion at Sunset Station. And remember, we're only gonna have two services that day at 10 o'clock and 11.30. So be thinking about who you want to invite. And in fact, we have invitations that you can take with you. They're out in the lobby, so be sure to grab some after service. Also talking about Easter, we'll be doing baptisms live in the service. So if you've been considering getting baptized, you can also sign up in the lobby after service. As you all know, we are working together with our other two campuses to give the food bank over 200,000 pounds of food. 
So be sure to involve your friends, your family, your coworkers. We want to overwhelm the food bank. And while we're talking about the food bank, let's take a look at a video. <laughs> Our city cries, she grieves, and out of her eyes she weeps. 58,000 tears of lives each week. Down her fine cheeks stream the food insecure, the elderly, the poor, children one in four. No food to digest, the side effects a light head. Her knees red from praying to have her needs met. Her vibrance dies just a little more these days. So we plead, will you please ease her pain and feed us. A. Lastly, in regard to Easter, volunteers, we could use some manpower. So if you're interested in helping out on Easter Sunday, you can sign up in the lobby. You can greet, you can usher, you can be a part of our setup or teardown. You can help collect food for the food bank. Again, you can sign up in the lobby after service. So small groups, we've been talking about small groups. Here's your chance to sign up for a small group. So after service, if you wanna go next door to the cafe, you can sign up, get more information about what groups are meeting, where and when, sign up for a group. Guys, I think that's it. I can't think of anything else that we need to talk about. No, no, nothing else. Okay, I think that's it. I'll see you guys next week. Bye. What? So it seems like every time I turn around, someone's getting married. Um, we're missing one of our guitar players today, and I wanted to say a big congratulations to Zach and Natalie Charo because they're now like a married couple. So yeah, give it up for Zach and Natalie. And so, Zach and Natalie, if you're on your honeymoon right now and you're watching church on the internet, we just want to say a big congratulations. And so, whatever you're doing right now, we think that you should tune into church, right? And, uh, so, that's what we think. And, you know, uh, the guy that was playing bass just a minute ago during the songs, his name's Eddie. And um, Eddie, like, just last year, uh, renewed his vows with his wife, Wendy. And I renewed their vows right over on the river walk on one of those bridges that goes over the river. And it was an amazing experience. You know, and Eddie and Wendy have understood something about their marriage is that, is that you've got to keep working on it to make it work, you know? So I see a lot of starry-eyed couples sometimes at the altar, excited. And then over the years, that excitement, excitement can wane. I've told you many times about the problems that my wife and I had in years past. Well, Pastor Brent was one of the people that really was instrumental to help Jeannie and I get our relationship, get our marriage back on track. And so I asked Pastor Brent if he would come um, for a couple of weeks downtown to help us on our marriages. And he great, graciously agreed to do that. And so you're going to uh, hear an amazing teaching from Brent today. Um, but you know, as we're thinking about this this message and this topic i understand some of you are not married and you're like hey i'm praying i was down here earlier praying god bring me a hot woman all right <laughs> or god bring me a rich man <laughs> so some of you are thinking um he's going to have a lot to apply for you because these principles are transferable in a lot of facets of our lives but um you know what happens in marriages sometimes is that we start out really close and then we drift apart. It's like we, we knew each other really well. We were really friends at first. And then we became someone I used to know. Now and then I think of when we were together. When you said you were so happy, happy Told myself you were the one for me But felt so lonely in your company But that was love and that's an ache I still remember You 
Please, can I you just can't. come here? This is how we become one of the 80%. No, 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 no. How we become one of the 80% is by not Christina. I don't want you Christina. to touch me right now. Okay? You're making this really difficult. I'm not. And Adam, any other woman would say the same thing right now. Christina, she kissed me. I told you about it. You asked me to fire her. I tried to fire her. I couldn't go through with it. I felt like her feelings were hurt. Her and feelings were hurt. Oh, God, I'm so happy that you care so much about her feelings. <laughs> Christina, can I'm you done. stay in the room? I've done everything. Can you stay in the room? I'm going to sit down. Every single time you need support, can emotionally. Can you stay in the room, please, anything. so we can talk about I'm it? I'm home every single day, making the kids' calendars. I know. Doing the cleaning, the cooking, everything. I'm Mrs. Braverman. I have my husband's back, always. Not anymore. Christina. I'm done. <laughs> Sometimes, despite our best efforts, we can find ourselves heading toward a relational wreck. As Doug uh, shared with you a moment ago, for the next few weeks, I want to talk to you about the second most relationship, the most important relationship that you will ever enter into, and that's your relationship with a spouse next to your relationship with God. Uh, your marriage relationship is the most important relationship for you to focus on. And so for the next couple of weeks, I want to talk to you a little bit about the marriage relationship. I've been married for 28 years, and what I've come to discover is that there, there are those good seasons where things are just trucking along well, and then there's some difficult seasons that you face. And I, I think it's how we 
handle things, how we handle the relationship in those difficult seasons that often determines whether we make or break the marriage. It was in one of those difficult seasons that uh, my wife and I found ourselves in a challenging situation. We were heading toward a relational wreck, and I discovered that I was driving the car. Now, I was a pastor here at City Church, and uh, came to a season where I was feeling discontent about what I was doing, and so I began to look for new places of ministry, uh, began a relationship with a church in Oregon and another one in Washington. I was getting ready to go uh, visit with those churches. Uh, since that time, I've come to, come to discover that one of my like recovery issues is that whenever I go through seasons of feeling discontent, I quickly just uh, make changes, move on to new pastures, rather than dealing with the issues and people in my life who may be uh, contributing to my feelings of discontent. And so anyway, during that same season, my wife was beginning to have some struggles of her own, and she went to see a counselor, and the counselor had her do one of those emotional health kind of tests, and the, emotional, uh, the, the counselor uh, told me that my wife scored uh, being severely depressed, one of the most depressed people she had ever scored in that particular test. And so I asked the counselor, well, what should I do? And she told me, well, what would you do if I just told you your wife had cancer? And I said, well, I would rearrange my life and do whatever I could to get her healed up, to get her well. And she said, well, then you do that. And I said, well, is there anything else I should do? And she said, you need to ask your wife, is there something she needs to tell you? And then be quiet and listen to her. And so I followed my counselor's advice, and I set my wife down, and I asked her, I said, how, you know, how are you feeling? Is, is there anything you need to say to me? And, and since that time, we've discovered that one of my wife's recovery issues is she doesn't normally tell people what she really, really thinks, what she really feels, and in particular, me. And so I asked her that question, and she just began to pour out her heart. The first thing she told me is, first of all, I don't want to move. I don't want to move to Oregon. I don't want to move to Washington. I don't want to go anywhere. And then for the next 30 minutes, she just sort of poured her heart out to me. And I think it was the first time in our marriage that she had told me what she really felt, how she really felt about our life and decisions that it, we had made in life. And to be honest, it's probably the first time I ever really listened to her. And so we found ourselves in this very difficult situation. Some walls had been constructed. Some dysfunctional patterns were going on. Some wounds had been created. And I found that the more intimate the relationship, the deeper and the more painful the wounds can be. Now, over the next few weeks, I want to talk to you about your marriage relationship and what I've been learning in my marriage. And uh, my goal is that over these next two weeks, this week and next week, that we will end this time together where the marriage is represented here, where you will be more one than you were when we began this journey together. If you are single and you're here, the statistics tell us that 85% of all singles will get married or get married again. And so you can apply these principles to preparing your life, your heart for someone you may want to marry. And also, I think you can use these principles to sort of discern who would be a good mate for you to pursue. And if you're single and you don't want to get married, you've had it with marriage or you're not interested in it, I think you can take these uh, relational concepts and apply them to any healthy relationship. But we're going to focus the next two weeks on uh, healthy relationships through the lens of the marriage relationship. And so I want to ask you this question. If you are married, are you one? Are you becoming more one? Are you becoming less one? Have walls been constructed between you? Have wounds created pain? Has conflict created distance? I'd like us to look at a conversation that Jesus had with some religious leaders regarding marriage and what Jesus said about becoming 
one as husband and wife. Now let me sort of set up what's going on here. We're going to be looking at Matthew chapter 19 if you want to uh, look at that with me. There were two competing religious schools in Jesus' day. They were sort of like the more conservative religious school and the more liberal re religious school. So there was like the Fox News kind of guys and then there was the CNN News kind of guys. They were the schools of Shammai and Hillel. And in the school of Shammai, they taught that a man could divorce his wife only for the cause of sexual infidelity. Now, the school of Hillel, they said that a man could divorce his wife for any and every reason as long as he gave her a certificate of divorce. And we even, we even have reports from Jesus' day where some religious leaders said that even if your wife burns supper, you can put her away. You can divorce her. How many of you would lose your wife on the first burnt supper? Okay. It was that bad. So anyway, some guys from the school of Hillel were trying to trap Jesus, and they have this conversation with Jesus, and in this conversation, I think we, we discover a, an important relational spiritual truth about how husbands and wives become one. This is Matthew chapter 19, verse 3. Some Pharisees came and tried to trap Jesus with this question. Should a man be allowed to divorce his wife for just any reason? Haven't you read the scriptures, Jesus replied. They record that from the beginning, God made them male and female. And he said, this explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. Since they are no longer two, but one, let no one split apart what God has joined together. Now, if you notice what Jesus did there, he redirected their question from focusing on what is the reason you can divorce to focusing on God's original intent behind the marriage uh, re relationship to begin with. And he reminds us that God's desire for every marriage is that two people would become united and become one. And Jesus also reminds us that God created the marriage relationship and he created it to be a covenant relationship. And it's not just a covenant relationship between a husband and a wife, but that he is a participant in it. So it's like a three-way kind of thing, only not the kinky kind of three-way. This is the good kind of three-way. Mm -hmm. I knew you were thinking such thoughts. Now, it's a three-way covenant. Now, I think it's important for us, if we're going to pursue oneness in marriage, to discern the difference between a contractual relationship and a covenant relationship. You see, when you enter into a contractual agreement with someone, you negotiate terms, and if any of those terms are not met, you feel justified in ending the relationship. But the marriage relationship is not primarily a contractual relationship. It is a covenant relationship. And a covenant relationship is unlike a contractual one. The biblical word that is most often translated covenant in the Old and New Testament is the Hebrew word hesed, which is translated in, in various ways, mercy, steadfast love, and devotion. And marriage is a covenant relationship agreement between God, a husband, and a wife. Now, when you think about your marriage rela relationship, I think it's important that you view it as a covenant. And I want you to think of another three-party covenant that we also can enter into. After uh, Jesus uh, was arrested, uh, before, I'm sorry, before Jesus was arrested, he gathered his disciples together and he, he celebrated his final Passover meal with them. And as a part of the meal, he passed out bread and wine and then he initiated what he called a new covenant. And I want you to notice what he says about this covenant. This is Luke 22, verse 20. After supper, he took another cup of wine and said, this is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood, which is poured out as a sacrifice for you. Here are the participants in this covenant. There's God the Father, there's Jesus Christ the Son, and then there is God's people who believe in him. And we believe that Jesus gave his life so that our sins could be paid for, so that we could have a covenant relationship 
with God. And it's my prayer that wherever you are in your spiritual journey, that somewhere along the way you will enter into that covenant through your faith in Jesus Christ. And this is what you'll discover about that covenant relationship. It is unconditional. When we believe in Jesus Christ and put our trust in Him, God declares that we are His children, our sins are forgiven, and He gives us eternal life unconditionally. And so when you think about your marriage covenant, I want you to think about it as an unconditional covenant. And so don't let words come from your mouth or don't, don't pursue actions that reflect that you view this as a conditional covenant or a contractual kind of relationship with your spouse. And please be careful about speaking words that suggest that you would uh, dissolve the relationship or leave if you're not getting your way or even divorce your spouse. That's not a healthy way to handle disagreement or conflict. Oneness does not grow out of a temporary contract. It grows out of a permanent covenant. Well, the Pharisees were not finished with their arguments with Jesus, and so they asked Jesus a follow-up question regarding Moses' law and divorce. This is Matthew 19, verse 7. Then why did Moses say in the law, that a man could give his wife a written notice of divorce and send her away, they asked. Jesus replied, Moses permitted divorce only as a concession to what? Your hard hearts. But it was not what God had originally intended. Now it's clear that the Pharisees were viewing marriage like a contract. It's a contract you, you enter into and then when you want to finish it, you just write another contract and you get out of it. Well, Jesus reminded the Pharisees, that God only gave permission for divorce as a concession to the hard-heartedness, primarily, in this case, of men. Now, that word translated hard hearts in Greek can be translated, it's like a word picture. It pictures coldness, stubbornness, uh, emotionally void, and even death. And this is what Jesus is saying to us, this important spiritual and relational reality. Hard hearts wreck oneness. Let me say it again. Hard hearts wreck oneness. Now, I want to pause for just a moment and say a word to those of you who have experienced a, a divorce, a very painful relational experience. These words are not meant to hammer you and to create more pain in your life. You cannot go back and change your past. But what we can do is focus on this day and this day forward. And I want to encourage you uh, to think about what we're going to talk about from, from that perspective. All right? Now, what Jesus is saying is that hard hearts wreck oneness. And I, I want us to get this picture of what he's saying. Jesus is saying that when you have two soft elements, like if you have two soft-hearted people, two soft-hearted people can become one. But if you have... A hard-hearted person or two hard-hearted people, they can never, ever become one. Two soft elements can become one. Now, I have up here on this table a couple of soft elements. I have here some milk. Ooh, and it's ice cold, too. Oh. And then I have some Hershey's chocolate syrup. Another soft element. Oh. And when you put two soft elements together and you stir them up, they can become one. Now, who would like to have chocolate milk in church? You want some chocolate milk, buddy? Well, come on up and get some chocolate milk right here at church. Come on. There you go. And that cup's yours, too. All right? All right. This is the church where you get chocolate milk, too. Yeah, baby. All right. Now, I have another glass couple of hard elements. This is some rocks and some marbles. And I can stir them together all I want. I can stir them all day long. I can stir them for months and months and years and years, but they'll never become one. Because two hard elements, no matter what you do to them, they never become one. And so I'm going to ask you a question. If you're married today, is your heart hard 
or is it soft? Some of you are here and you know that your marriage is in trouble because there's hard heartedness on the part of one or both of you. And yeah, you try to stir together some, but you know you are not one. You may share a house, you may even share a bed, but you know you are not becoming one. Well, hard hearts wreck oneness. What makes a heart hard? Well, sociologist Dr. John Gottman did this study. And this is what he did. I want you to think about this. He talked 49 couples into living in this big apartment complex where he could study them, where he had cameras for 16 years. You ever seen the show Big Brother? Okay, it's like Big Brother for 16 years. And he studied everything about them, including their conflict. And what he discovered over those 16 years, the data allowed him to predict which marriages would fail at an accuracy rate of 91%. And what happened is he discovered there were four triggers related to dysfunctional ways of handling conflict that if these four triggers, if any of these triggers were present, it greatly increased the likelihood that that couple would experience divorce. First trigger, First trigger. Criticism. 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 Now, criticism is different than a complaint. A complaint is a normal part of every healthy relationship, as is conflict. You know, some people think that, that the absence of conflict means that's a good relationship. That does not mean a good relationship. Like in the case of my wife, she just never told me anything. There was never any conflict, but that's because she never told me how she really felt, right? Good conflict, healthy conflict, is a, is a healthy part of every relationship. But there's a difference between a complaint and criticism. A complaint is a focus on a problem. Like he always leaves the toilet seat up, and in the middle of the night when I try to go to the bathroom, I fall down into the toilet. That's a complaint. <laughs> he always drinks milk straight from the cart and gets his germs all over everything. That's a complaint. You can talk about a complaint, and it can be a part of healthy conflict. But a complaint is different than a criticism because a criticism focuses on attacking a person or a person's character. You see how, how that's different? A complaint attacks a problem, and that's okay, that's healthy. Criticism is where you start attacking the person. And where there is criticism, hearts become hard. Hearts become hard. Second trigger, contempt. We show contempt when we show disgust by name-calling, mocking, belittling with our words, or you can even do it physically. You can roll your eyes, or you, you can give them that look. You can sneer, or you can even touch in a condescending way. You ever done that where you touch your spouse in a condescending way? And this is what's going to happen. If you feel contempt in your heart, it will come out. You cannot keep it in. It will come out, and it will create hard hearts. Third trigger, defensiveness. Defensiveness occurs when a guilty person does not admit their guilt and never uh, asks for forgiveness or apologizes. When one or both of the spouses become defensive, this is what it creates. It creates a standoff between enemies rather than a truce between allies. And where defensiveness is present, hearts become hard. Fourth trigger, withdrawal. Withdrawal. That occurs when one or both spouses Spouses stop working for oneness and they settle for living two lonely lives. They can live separate financial lives, live separate social lives, you know what I mean? He has his friends, she has her friends, but they don't really have friends that they share. It can even lead to having uh, se separate beds. Acts of withdrawal include ignoring your spouse, turning your back on your spouse, tuning your spouse out and disengaging emotionally. And this is what Dr. Gottman found. 85% of spouses who withdrew were husbands. So it's guys, it's like it's one of our go-to moves. When there's conflict with, with you and your wife, one of our go-to moves is just to begin to withdraw and separate. And where there is withdrawal, hearts become hard. So if you're married, I want to ask this question. Are any of these triggers present in your marriage setting off relational bombs wrecking your marriage? 
What can we do? What can we do to keep our hearts soft? Let's say that you're, you're in a marriage and you say, no, you know, Pastor Brent, our hearts are soft. We're, we're doing okay. What can we do to keep our hearts soft? And then what can you do if you would say, you know, Pastor Brent, I think, I think there's a little bit of hardness of heart either with me or maybe, maybe your spouse senses that. What can you do to soften hard hearts? This is what I've come to discover, at least in my own relationship with my wife. First of all, you soften hard hearts when you communicate. When you communicate. Oneness doesn't just happen. It's not going to happen because you share a house, you share bank accounts, you share a bed. You've got to work at it. It's like Doug said, you've got to work at it if you want to make it work. And by communicating, I mostly mean listening. Because for numerous years in my marriage, I was good at the talking part of communication, but I was not very good at the listening part of communication. For some of you, the next right thing in your marriage is to become a good listener, to do what that counselor told me to do with my wife, to ask your spouse this question, is there something you need to say to me? And then to just shut up and let your spouse speak. And let me tell you what, this is particularly important if you're the more dominant personality in the marriage relationship. Now, I'm the more dominant personality, and I, it's, it's incumbent upon me to create the environment where my wife feels like she can really speak up and tell me how she really feels. So where, where are my people who know you're the more dominant person? Let me see your hands. We, we have all passive people here in the downtown campus? Yeah, thank you. I got one guy who's honest. Thank you. All right. If you're the more dominant personality and you were too chicken to raise your hand, it is incumbent upon you to create that environment where your spouse feels comfortable and safe to communicate whatever they feel. Second uh, action that I believe can soften hearts and keep hearts soft is when you make amends. When you make amends. The longer you are married, the more likely you will have sinned against your spouse. And sometimes when you've sinned against your spouse, either through proactive action or through neglect, you just keep on doing the same thing over and over. And then by that point, you just don't even think about what you're doing anymore. That's what happened in my life. And when, when, when we fail to make amends, wounds create pain, walls create division, and hearts become hard. Now, this is how we make amends around here. We, we figure out how to name the sin that we have committed against our spouse. Call it what it is. And then you go to your spouse and you say this, I sinned against you by getting angry with you. Name it what it is. And say, I was wrong. Will you forgive me? No excuses. No justifying why you, no, no, oh, I had a bad day. And a, no, no excuses. You confess your sin and you ask for forgiveness. That's how you make amends. And let me... If you will make amends, you can soften hard hearts. The next action to take, you can soften hearts when you forgive. Marital oneness requires more forgiveness than any other relationship. Forgiveness feeds oneness. Forgiveness tears down walls. Forgiveness heals wounds. Forgiveness softens hard hearts hearts. And so this is what I'm asking us to do as a church for the couples represented here. I'm asking you sometime this week to do the next right thing in your marriage. And this is what I believe the next right thing very likely is for most of us. I want you to take a piece of paper or if you like to do stuff on your, your iPhone or your iPad or your computer, whatever. And I want you to write two uh, phrases on, on that piece of paper. I need to make amends for dot, dot, dot. And then I want you to take maybe an hour, maybe even a half day if you can get it, and just sit down in silence and let God's Spirit speak to you and remind you of, of ways in which you have sinned against your spouse. And just begin to list them. Write them out. I need to make amends for. And then sometime this week, I want you to go to your spouse and make amends. And you just begin by saying, these are the ways in which I know that I have sinned against you. Name those ways and ask. Just say, admit, confess, I was wrong. Will you forgive me? 
make amends. Then on the other side of the sheet of paper or down further down the list if you're going to use your computer or your phone, I want you to write this phrase. I need to forgive for dot, dot, dot. And what are the ways in which your spouse has hurt you through words, through deeds, or even through neglect? Write them out. And this time, I don't want you to talk to your spouse about that. I want this to be between you and God, and I want you to, uh, phrase by phrase, word by word, sin by sin, just to forgive your spouse and let it go. And let the peace of God fill your heart as you forgive. I believe that as we forgive our spouses of what they have done against us, our hearts get soft. And that's my prayer for you. Now, if, if you're here and, and you would say, you know, Pastor Brent, I think my marriage is in a little bit of trouble. You know, what, what you've just told me to do, I, I, I'll do that and I'll get it started, but I think we need some help. We have two of our pastors who've created uh, a marriage enrichment program that we borrowed from another church. It's called Reengage, And they're going to uh, put on a marriage enrichment retreat it's going to be the weekend of May 24th through 26th. And for some of you, the next right thing is to go to this retreat, to rearrange your schedule, get babysitters or whatever you got to do and go to this retreat. You can register online at brcc.net. Go to event calendar and scroll through to May. You can register there or you can just call the church office and say, I want to go to that marriage retreat and we'll take it from there. But here's what I'm asking you to do, okay, everybody? Give me your... What is the next right thing for you to do? I've been praying for you that, that God would show you what the next right thing is for you to do. And that's what I'm asking you to do today. And there is hope. No matter where you are in your relationship with your spouse, there is hope that God can restore your marriage and He can make two people one. Now, I wanted to end by telling you the story of one person whose marriage was saved. Years ago, I was traveling uh, with a group down to the orphanage that our church supports in Chihuahua, Mexico. And uh, on the way back, I was driving the van and I heard this teenage boy bragging about the change that had occurred in his dad's life when his dad trusted in Christ. And of course, any of you been around teenage boys, I, you hardly ever hear a teenage boy bragging about his dad for anything, right? And so I sort of perked up and listened to the story and it was such a compelling story I talked to his dad, and his dad wrote out his story of what had happened, and he gave me permission to share it with you. This is his story and his words. I did not grow up with any kind of religious background. Personally, I had never given Jesus much thought. I never thought God could love me, and no one had ever told me about God's grace in a way that I understood. My wife's life mirrored mine, except that she had some church growing up. However, she was mostly trying to work her way to heaven by following rules and regulations. My wife and I found little happiness during the first 11 years of our marriage, other than our love for our two children. Neither of us could figure out why we weren't happy, and it always seemed like it was somebody else's fault. Well, after years of verbal abuse, frustration, depression, and thoughts of suicide, my wife decided she was going to leave me. She soon fell in love with a co-worker. My wife eventually told me that she wanted a divorce and she planned to leave me for him. When she told me that, my life fell apart. I became angry and emotional. A lifetime of suppressed depression and buried emotions and thoughts of suicide took control of me. I couldn't imagine losing my children and my wife to another man. I forced my wife to give me the number of the man she was seeing. Then I called him up, called him every four-lettered word you can think of, and I told him I was coming over to kill him. On my way out the door, my son had overheard what I had said on the phone, and he grabbed my legs and he cried and he begged me not to go. Broken and devastated, I realized I needed help. I went to see a counselor, and I remember laying down on her couch and telling her, I'm a mess and I need you to fix me. My counselor told me the most important thing I could do was to find my faith. 
A few weeks later, I went to a Christian event where men were challenged to become better husbands and fathers. And at that event, for the first time, I heard about God's love for me. I heard how my sins could be forgiven and how I could have a relationship with God through my faith in Christ. When I went home, I was a changed person. My family asked me what had happened. I told them about my new faith, and we all cried together. We committed our family to the Lord and asked Him to help us. Within a few months, my wife also trusted in Christ. He set her free from depression, suicidal thoughts, and a lifetime of hurts and anger toward me. We forgave each other of a bunch of junk from our past. Because of our decisions to follow Christ, God saved our marriage. This year, we celebrated 25 years together. No matter where you are in your relationship with your spouse, there is hope. God can soften hard hearts, and He can make two people become one. And that's my prayer for you today. Let's pray together. First, I want to pray for the married couples who are represented here. And I want to ask if your spouse is present and you're comfortable doing this. Maybe you would take the hand of your spouse and just hold on to each other for a moment. I'm going to pray a blessing over you and over your marriage relationship. Lord God, we say in your presence that we are so grateful for your love for us. And we're grateful that you created the marriage relationship, a man and a woman, two people becoming one. And Lord, I ask you to bless the marriages represented here. I ask you to pour out your spirit upon us. I ask that you would bring forgiveness where there have been hurts. I ask that you would bring oneness between us. I ask that you would heal any wounds that are present. Lord God, through your spirit of forgiveness and grace, I ask that you would make us one with our spouses and bless us as we seek to do the next right thing. And then, Lord, I pray for those who are here for whom the next right thing is to put their trust in your son, Jesus Christ. That's what happened to my friend in the story I read about a moment ago. It began when he put his trust in the son of God and he became a different person. And if you know that's where you are in your spiritual journey, maybe you would pray this prayer with me silently as I pray it out loud. God, I do believe in you. And I believe that Jesus is your son. And I believe he died on the cross to pay for my sins. I ask you to forgive me of my sins, to wash away my guilt, and to make me your child. Lord God, I pray for those who have just prayed that prayer with me, and I ask that through your spirit, you would wash away any guilt, wash away any burden they feel, I pray that through your spirit, you would give them confidence in knowing that through their faith in your son, they are now your children. I pray that you would make them new creations. Your word says that if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things pass away. New things come. I pray that new things would come for him and for her. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Amen. Doug. Would you guys join me in thanking Pastor Brent for coming down and giving us this great word today? Yeah, that's good. That's good. So if you just began a personal relationship with Christ today, the next logical step for you is to be baptized. Let others know about your new faith in Christ, and we're going to have a baptism on Easter Sunday. You know that we're cooking up some yummy stew for Easter this year. We're going to be pounding the city's food bank with food, and a lot of you are doing micro drives, and if you want to take some of those uh, big red tubs, you have to sign those out in the back. You can take those to your businesses or schools or whatever to uh, raise food for our city's food bank. Jesse's going to have Jai Roots and our own Linwood King uh, for Easter to do some music. It's going to be a fantastic time for that. We have invites 
in the uh, lobby out there if you want to grab one of those invites to give to friends. If you guys give away all the invites, then we will print some more. Don't you worry, but you guys grab all you need. Also, I want to ask you if you go to this service, it's regularly kind of crowded at the 1130 time slot. And so if you would ever consider um, moving to the one o'clock service, that would be helpful because a lot of times um, this service gets really crowded and people are coming back to church will come at 1130 and you get to sleep in if you go to one, right? You get to sleep even longer than what you did today. And so you thought you were being a slacker by sleeping till 10 and coming to church at 1130. I mean, you could really be a slacker if you were going to church at one o'clock with the rest of the slackers who are there. So uh, last thing I want to uh, remind you about is our offering. Now, in your seat, you probably sat down on a, uh, one of those offering envelopes, and that's one of the tools that we use to give down here. Now, if you're new to church, we're not that church that's always begging for your money and all that, where some guy is, like, living in a palace and building this big palatial, ornate church building um, here. I'm actually homeless right now. I don't have a home. And so my family and I are like in this one room, but, um, and we don't have an opulent church building either. Look around, you know, no stained glass. We don't even own the building. So we're kind of like homeless pastor, homeless church. That's the way it works down here. Um, but those of us who are Christ followers, we do what's called percentage giving, or some people call it tithing, where you give like a tenth in that. And we do that gladly, those of us that follow Christ, because of the great things that God has done for us. And so we say here, we don't give out of scarcity, right? You know what scarcity is? It's kind of like being stingy. Have you ever met someone that you really loved that was stingy? Um, anybody know that person? Um, okay, you're, you're probably not. You're not, probably not saying, man, I love that stingy person. They're so much fun to be around, man. Just so cheap all the time. And always sticks me with the bill at, at dinner or whatever. We never love the stingy people, the people out of, operating their lives out of, uh, out of scarcity. But we typically love those people who are generous, right? And we want to be generous. So we give out of what's called abundance. That is the overflow of all that God's done in our lives. Hey, God, you've provided everything that I need. And so I thank you. For a lot of us who know Christ, it's like, God, you sent your son to pay the ultimate price to die on the cross so that I could come to know you. Out of the overflow of my heart, I want to give. So take the envelope, use that as a tool. You can drop it in the offering box in the back. Others like to give at the giving kiosk in the lobby, and still others like to give on their phone or at citychurchdowntown.com. You can do it any of those ways, and as you give, just say a prayer over it and ask God to bless it. So why don't we stand up together, and let's pray and ask God to bless our offering today. Would you join me in that prayer? God, I want to thank you for our people and for the many who are just giving generously, not being legalistic about it, you know, wondering how little they can give to just keep you from getting mad. We don't give out of law, God. We give out of love for you. And I pray that as our people pour out generously in their financial giving to further your kingdom, I ask you to bless them. God, we're not giving just so you will bless us. But either way, I want to ask you, because these are great, hardworking people, many of them working hard all week and giving sacrificially so that the poor can be fed and children can be ministered to. And I just ask you to bless them for that. Bless their marriages. Bless their businesses. Bless their jobs. Bless those who are without jobs. Provide them with the right job. Some who are discontent in their current employment, I pray you bless them with new jobs. And Father, as we leave this place, we pray that we would leave in oneness. We pray that we would walk from this place like chocolate milk, Lord, <laughs> to your glory. And we pray these things in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hey, you guys have a great week. Go drink some chocolate milk. Have a good one. We'll see you.